The topic for this section is infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is an infection of the endocardial layer, which is the innermost layer of the heart. It is contagious within the heart valves. Infective endocarditis was fatal until the development of penicillin. And even though we have lots of antibiotics and infective endocarditis is relatively uncommon, there are approximately 15,000 new cases of infective endocarditis diagnosed each year in the United States. Infective endocarditis occurs when blood flow turbulence within the heart allows the causative organisms to infect previously damaged valves or the endothelial surfaces. This can occur in individuals with a variety of cardiac conditions or patients who do not have cardiac conditions at all. Most commonly it is affected by the Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus viridans bacteria. Vegetations, which are the primary lesions of ineffective endocarditis, consist of fibrins, leukocytes, platelets, and microbes that adhere to the valve surface. The loss of portions of these vegetations into the circulatory system can result in embolizations. Rheumatic heart disease also used to be a contributing factor to infective endocarditis, but now it contributes to less than 20% of the cases. Currently, the main contributing factors to infective endocarditis are increasing age, IV drug users, dental procedures, patients who have prosthetic valves, someone who has cardiac lesions, rheumatic fever can be a cause, but again it's a, a less common cause, individuals with congenital heart defects, use of intravascular devices, or patients on renal dialysis. And these risk factors are increased for individuals such as patients on renal dialysis, IV drug users, patients who are repeatedly potentially introducing bacteria into the bloodstream have a very high risk for developing infective endocarditis. The majority of patients with infective endocarditis will have a low-grade fever. They may also have chills. They'll typically represent with weakness, malaise, fatigue, anorexia. They may also have vascular manifestations, which will be described on the next slide. But there's also the possibility of an embolization to an organ, which can cause an organ infarction. Typical organs that this may occur in could be the spleen, the kidney, there also may, may be emboli in the arms or the legs. This diagram depicts the pathogenesis of infective endocarditis. Once vegetations occur, they can break off, causing emboli embolizations. Many people with infective endocarditis will develop systemic embolization. This occurs when the left-sided heart vegetation moves to various organs, such as the brain, kidney, or spleen, and to the extremities, causing limb infarction. Right-sided heart lesions embolize to the lungs, resulting in a pulmonary embolism. The infection may spread locally and damage the valves or the stru supporting structures. This can cause dysrhythmias, valve dysfunction, dysfunction, and the eventual invasion of the myocardium, leading to heart failure sepsis, and heart block. Provided here are some images of a variety of vascular manifestations that can occur in someone with infective endocarditis. And typically these result from a fragment, fragmentation of a microscopic embolism from those vegetative lesions that have traveled through the system and have caused splinter hemorrhages in the nail beds, petechiae on the skin, Osler nodes on fingers and toes, Jane's Way lesions on palms or soles, and Roth spots on the retina. Other manifestations is typically a patient with infective endocarditis will represent with a murmur. It may be a new murmur or the murmur has gotten worse. 
heart failure will be seen in 80% of the patients who have aortic valve endocarditis. And then other manifestations may be secondary to an embolism. So if the patient has an embolism to the spleen, the patient may have sharp left upper quadrant pain. Uh, if an emboli has gone to the kidneys, they may have flank pain, hematuria, hematuria azotemia. If the emboli has traveled to the arms or the legs, you would have signs and symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis. When we're suspecting infective endocarditis in a patient, we want to get a thorough health history. We're going to be asking about any recent invasive procedures, which can include dental, urological, surgical, or gynecological procedures. We want to know about their heart history, if they've had any recent cardiac catheterizations or surgery on the heart, if they've had any intravascular devices placed, such as a PIC line, a central venous catheter, if they are a renal dialysis patient, and if they've had any recent type of infection, including skin, respiratory, or urinary tract. To have a definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis, you need to have two of the major criteria positive. You have three um, tests here that can be done. So two of them, like I said, must be positive to be infective endocarditis. It could be that they have positive blood cultures, they have a new or changed murmur, or on their echocardiogram you see an intracardiac mass or they have vegetations. Additional tests will be done to provide more information on the extent of the illness and how the patient is functioning. Chest x-rays and EKGs can provide more information on the extent of the disease. White blood cell count can tell how bad the infection is. Estimated sed sedimentation rate, ESR or C-reactive protein, are also elevated during extreme inflammation. And coronary catheterization or angiogram um, can also be done to look at the extent of damage within the heart valves, but this is typically not the test of the test that you would choose first because a lot of times you don't want to do a cardiac catheterization with someone who is acutely ill. Typical treatment for infective endocarditis will consist of IV antibiotics and typically, typically it'll be several weeks of IV antibiotics and these are usually strong antibiotics. So anybody who's getting long-term antibiotics will need to have the antibiotic serum levels monitored. So you'll be monitoring peaks or troughs for the medication. For example, if the patient was getting vancomycin, which is a medication that is highly nephrotoxic, we would draw a trough prior to the administration of a dose. So let's say our medication is supposed to be given at 9, we might draw a trough at 8.30. We would check to see what the level is if the level is within the normal range, then we would administer the medication as ordered. If the trough level is too low, then that may mean that there is not effective amounts of the antibiotic in the circulating blood system, and a physician would need to be called to increase the dosage. If the dose is too high, then we have too high of levels in the circulating system, and then the patient is at risk for some of those negative side effects of the antibiotic. Again, the healthcare provider would need to be called and the medication would be typically decreased, the dose. We'll also order subsequent blood cultures to make sure that the, that the bacteria is responding to the medications. And anytime patients are on antibiotics, we want to monitor their renal function. So we'd be watching to make sure that their BUN creatinines have not increased and their GFR decreased. If the patient has fungal or prostatic, prostatic valve endocarditis, oftentimes this type of endocarditis does not respond to antibiotics. This patient may actually need to have their valve replaced. And anytime someone has had infective endocarditis, they must now, for the rest of their life, take prophylactic treatments before any dental or any invasive procedures. The tables here list for you the cardiac conditions that require prophylactic antibiotics to prevent endocarditis. It also shows you other situations that would require antibiotics, any type of procedures. So again, dental procedures, respiratory incisions, 
um, if a person has um, a urinary tract infection or an infected wound would also be reasons why someone would need to have prophylactic antibiotics. Typically, when we're doing our assessment on someone who has infective endocarditis, we'll probably find the following abnormal assessments. Typically, the person with infective endocarditis is very sick when they come to the hospital. So they're probably very fatigued. They may be having pain. We want to do a good head-to-toe skin assessment so we can observe for any of those vascular abnormalities. We also want to observe for any possible embolic complications. When we're listening to their heart, we're probably hearing a murmur. We may hear an S3 or an S4 heart sound, and we want to make sure we're monitoring their vitals. Because of the problem with their valve, they may have decreased cardiac output, so we may see a person who's tachypnic or has crackles in their lungs. They also may have pain in their joints and muscles. We always want to promote activity with our patients, but we want to make sure we increase their activity slowly. This is a person who should be wearing TEDS stockings or support hose because they have a risk for developing a lower extremity blood clot. We want to have them wear these hose to prevent that. We'll do coughing and deep breathing. We want to make sure that they know the signs and symptoms of complications or worsening disease and that we are observing for those as well. We'd also want to teach them about risk reduction. So they're at risk for infection and a recurrent infection, so they want to avoid sick people. They want to have good nutrition. They want to have good oral hygiene, so they're not increasing bacteria into their blood system. And they also need to know that they need to notify their health care provider prior to any invasive procedures, including dental procedures, so they can get prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotics.